What is up? What is good? How you living? How you feeling? It is time to get ready for the NFL draft because I don't know if you've looked at your calendar. It is April and we are four weeks away from the NFL draft. 28 days. I got my man Connor Rogers with me. He's been getting me ready for our big time draft show with our special guest. And if you're watching right now, you are cramming. You're either watching like I am on the BR app or you are checking us out on BR YouTube, Gridiron Twitter. Uh, Special shout out as always to Rod Simeon and the Regulators for the intro music. And we have a great guest today. Mike Tannenbaum, former Jets GM and Dolphins EVP, will be joining us shortly to go over a bunch of the trades that happened. What could this mean? He always has great info. Excited to talk to him. And the theme today, Connor, is workout warriors. That is our theme. The guys that have been jumping off the page in terms of the pro day. If you are commenting on the app, we will get to your comments throughout the show. I'm looking, no April Fool's jokes on this show, I promise. Uh, and then, of course, uh, submit your videos in the NFL Draft community, uh, and then we can play them in. And if we play them during the show, you will be getting a hoodie. Gave away three last week, hoping to give away much more this week. Connor, I'm going to give it to you in a second. But first, let's go to an app video comment. Nicole Antonio, I think this is a question for you. All right, Connor, let go with the theme being workout warriors. I have to know, what is your daily go-to workout routine? And to be clear, I am not asking for myself, but I am asking for my boyfriend. <laughs> this is a Connor question. Hey. It fits the theme of the show. I'm no workout wonder here, Lefko, but it's draft season. I'm in a nice groove. Got to get things going by 7. Uh, keep it simple. Monday through Saturday, Sunday, take the day off, and just split everything up. A little chest on its own, buys and tries, shoulders on its own, legs twice a week is the secret. So there you go. There's my workout wonder advice of the week. Nicole, my, uh, my secret is... Um... I, I don't got none. Listen to Connor. Connor, before we bring in uh, Tannenbaum, because I, I would you want to bring him on, my, my question for you, since our theme is Workout Wonders, compared to years past, I know we're only dealing with pro days. What kind of supreme athletes do we have in this draft compared to years past? Really special. And I think a lot of people will look at it and they'll sit there and they'll go, you know, oh, these don't count the same because it's not at the combine and they're not laser times and it's pro days. But I would argue a little bit, Lefko, that these guys are just, you know, more comfortable right now. Uh, they're in the atmosphere they're used to. The nerves aren't there as much, and they're ready to go. They've had more time to really just buckle down and get ready for these pro days. It's a special group of athletes. We're going to talk through a ton of them today, wide receivers, edge pass rushers, linebackers, you name it. But before we do that, like you said, I'm excited to talk trades here uh, with Mike Tannenbaum. Let's bring him on. It's not talking baseball. I know Connor's upset because the Mets uh, opening day got canceled. Sorry. Uh, but let's bring him in. Former Jets GM, Dolphins EVP, does great stuff over at ESPN, Mike Tannenbaum. Mike, welcome to the show, pal. How you doing? How you feeling? You know, I'm a former Pittsfield Mets intern, you know, so we can tie in opening day and talk all the Mets you'd like to. I know Connor would, but that's why I'm here, Mike, to get this back to the straight and narrow. Let's just let's go right to the trade that shook everything last week. Uh, Dolphins go back, eventually move back up. But the big note here, Niners going third. I saw that you were in agreement with a few other people. This has to be for Mac Jones. I saw you saying there's a lot of comparisons to Matt Ryan. Do you still feel that way after you've had a few days to digest this and talk to people? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I spoke to a handful of people in and around the league, and I felt strongly beforehand and even more so now for a number of reasons. First of all, Mac Jones really processes information really quickly. He's a better athlete than people realize, and I think the Matt Ryan comparison is really good. I had a former head coach yesterday compare him to Philip Rivers, and I think it's notable, guys, that on the same day that both Mac Jones in Tuscaloosa and Justin Fields in Ohio State were working out that Kyle Shanahan, the head coach of the 49ers, and John Lynch, their GM, were in Tuscaloosa. And you guys touched on it a little bit. It's still an unusual offseason. And the fact that they were in uh, Alabama, not Ohio State, is meaningful in my opinion. And I think their decision has been made candidly. You can't give up two first-round picks and a third guys and not know what you're doing. So to me... They went down there to see him, but I, I think for them, the hay is certainly in the barn. 
Connor, I'm going to get to you in a second, but I want to get to this app comment and give it to Mike. JJ09, this is the dilemma that I think draft fans are going through, and they set it out. Why are people continuing to insist that Mac Jones is going to be in the top 10? I would take Trubisky over Mac. Now listen, this is a fan comment. The, the inner workings of the NFL may go over their head, but... Tannenbaum, there's this thing that happens when fans look at mock drafts and they've been looking at them for months and they start here and they start thinking, oh, this is where a guy is supposed to go. That with Mac Jones specifically, I think people are having a hard time thinking of him up there because they haven't seen him up there in months. What do you take? What's your take on that? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And it's funny how um, the that no comment from uh, one of the fans is talking about Trubisky, how about this? Over the last 10 years, five times a team has traded up into the top three to take a quarterback. RG3, Carson Wentz, Jared Goff, Sam Darnold, and Mitch Trubisky. And none of those five are still with the team that traded up for him, or I would say Sam Darnold certainly imminent. So um, I think as it relates to Jones guys, like he's been a good player. Where he's been mocked are, are obviously things that he can't control, but you certainly could say that, you know, if Tua Tongvalo won five last year um, and he had what the weapons he had around him, what Mac Jones did, which was more productive with less weapons, certainly puts him in that conversation in the top five. And candidly, I would take him over Daniel Jones, who just a couple of years ago also won in that part of the draft. Last question for Mike before I go to Connor. So wait, if you were a GM and you saw that stat, about top five picks trading up and then you were a GM, would you trade up for a quarterback or seeing that, would that scare you away? Yeah, I think what it does, Adam, is it just makes you double down on your research and your preparation. You know, going back uh, over a decade ago with uh, Mark Sanchez, we had concerns about the fact that he had very little experience at USC and, and Coach Parcells always talked about in college football, every 10 starts, quarterbacks should get discernibly better with experience. And Mark had 13 starts at SC, and that was a big concern. And what's unusual about Mark Sanchez is he came in and played very well, took us to two championship games, and then had some struggles. And I would certainly want to know that information about trading up for Mac Jones. But what really has served me well in my career, guys, is when you trade up and give up the assets that you do, the character and the talent, you have to check every box. And there's no doubt that Mac Jones has really tremendous intangibles. That stat would make me... I would say proceed, but I'm proceeding with even more caution. Connor, uh, we were talking before that this entire week has felt like Justin Fields, I'm here, I'm great, stop trash talking me. It's been like a very conflicting week. And the fact that the pro day was the same day as Mac Jones, Connor, what did you take away from Justin Fields' pro day and just the conversation at large? Well, I thought overall he obviously did a good job. Now, these are pro days, as Mike knows really well, so how much can you really take from it? But obviously the scripted workout was really good. We know he's a great athlete. He goes out there and runs a 4-4-4, which is just a tremendous time for a quarterback, a big-bodied quarterback that can push the ball down the field, and he's really accurate at all three levels. So we know the physical attributes are there for Justin Fields. Now, when I hear a lot of these different various rumors about uh, whatever you want to say about, I don't know, character or work ethic or anything like that. Everybody I've talked to at Ohio State uh, loves the guy, believes the hard work is there and that he's only going to get better over time. So I think it's been a good week for Justin Fields. Now, would I be surprised if Mac Jones is drafted ahead of him? I would not be surprised, but that's not what I would do. I, I think the sky is really the limit. I think the ceiling with Justin Fields is special. And I feel the same way about Trey Lance, who I think is uh, under, under consideration to be the number three overall pick as well, making for a really interesting conversation. So there's a lot of varying opinions, and I think a lot of teams are definitely holding their cards really, really tight. But it goes to show you that when all is said and done, we're going to have five quarterbacks taken in the top eight of this draft. Mm. Wow. I think also when you factor in that you have Carolina sitting there at eight, Denver sitting there at nine. Uh, we talked before, who knows what Miami's thinking about doing at six. And Tannenbaum, I'm going to go to you here. Uh, Bugsy Moogs asked this question. After the pro day results, who do you have the Finns taking at six from Bugsy Moogs? Uh, there was some talk that I saw, Mike, that people 
Uh, the Dolphins, they traded back up to six because they want to get either a Chase or a Devontae Smith. Knowing that organization, seeing that they don't have a ton of holes in their roster, what do you see for the Finns at six? I think it's going to be Jamar Chase from LSU or Kyle Pitts, the tight end from Florida. And I think it's really going to be whoever Cincinnati doesn't take. And I know that sounds like Joe Burrow's been lobbying pretty hard for them to draft Jamar Chase, the former LSU teammate at five with Cincinnati. So I think the other inflection point in this draft is going to be at four with Atlanta, where Trey Lance, to me, has a ton of upside. Only played in one game this year because of COVID. And North Dakota State just only had one opponent. But I think Justin Fields and Trey Lance will definitely be in the mix for Atlanta. Four, again, there could be a surprise. You guys already mentioned Carolina at eight. Could they come up? But I think Miami clearly went from 12 to six, gave up a one next year for one of those high-end skill players. I have a question Connor, here from yeah, Mike. Go for Mike. It, Mike, you built, obviously, those great New York Jets teams that had the best offensive line in football with the young quarterback behind them. Do you find it interesting how much and how often we talk about – and if, I agree, I think it's going to happen with Cincinnati and Miami. They're looking at skill players. But two teams that their offensive line is incomplete. This is a good offensive line class, especially a tackle. Do you find it interesting that it seems like those position, positions just aren't in consideration for either of them right now? Yeah, Kyle, it's a really fair point. Um, I had the good fortune my first time – as a GM, first, literally our first draft, we had two ones, and we took the Bergeshaw Ferguson, left tackle from Virginia, and Nick Mangle, the 29 center from Ohio State. And they were building blocks for a number of good teams we had for over a decade. And look, it's not the most sexy pick and a lot of pizzazz, but it is the foundation for success. And you know, show me a good team, I'm going to show you a good offensive line. So certainly Cincinnati at five, even Miami at six, although I doubt it, they certainly will – to be discussing some of those offensive linemen. And ironically, some of these Miami trades go back to when we drafted Laramie Tunsil in Miami, where he felt us because of obviously what happened when the draft started. But Panay Suell, there's a bunch of guys, Christian Darasaw, Slater uh, from Northwestern. There's a number of frontline tackles that could come in and start right away. Yeah, Connor, I'm always interested with the Falcons at four because two years ago they took Lidstrom and McGarry both in the first round. Are they worried about doing it again? But at the same point, if you can build the offensive line, I mean, this is just football guaranteed knowledge. You're going to be a lot better. Uh, Connor, I want to go to you here first because my birds, my eagles, are now at 12. Uh, and I'm glad they got another first-round pick with the Carson Wentz trade. It should be apparently three first-round picks. We'll see how that goes. Uh, but at 12, what do you think is a great pick for the eagles at 12, Connor? Honestly, whoever falls out of the top four blue chip kind of pass catchers left go. And you just heard Mike say it, that Jamar Chase and Kyle Pitts, not going to be there. You're not getting that lucky. And that's the risk you take when you move that far back. But Devontae Smith or Jalen Waddell becomes really, really interesting. I think they're a team that we've seen them value speed in the past. So maybe they go with somebody that is a little bit more polished in Devontae Smith. And I think people will think, wow, it's crazy for one of them to be there. But it's really not. Like we said, five quarterbacks probably going in the top eight to ten picks. A couple offensive tackles. Micah Parsons might find his way in there, especially with Detroit picking in the top ten. I think the Eagles got to be all over these pass catchers if they really, really want to give Jalen Hurts a chance. Yeah, as an Eagles fan, it's tough going right after the Cowboys and then the Giants. But, Mike, just as someone that's been in the front office, what is your read on Howie? And where do you think Howie Roseman would be leaning after trading back and sitting at 12? Yeah, I think they clearly said that Jalen Hurst is their guy, at least for this year. And they deserve a ton of credit in terms of sitting there potentially with three number one picks next year, assuming Carson Wentz plays 75% or more for the Colts. So I think I agree with Connor. I think they'll come out of this with a, a frontline skill player. And I don't think Kyle Pitts will be there, especially after yesterday. But someone should fall to them, um, a, a good skill player and – it's been unusual so far, but I think clearly that's the way the board's setting up. I think one of the most interesting things to me, if I could be a fly on the wall of any of the 32 teams, is Dallas. Because, you know, last year they had a lot of holes in the offensive line. I certainly thought that's the way they were going to go. And inexplicably, C.D. Lamb's sitting there, and they take him. And I thought that was a reasonable decision at the time. And let's just run this play one more time. What happens, you know, pick a name, Jalen Waddle. Let's say Kyle Pitts is there for them. They are desperate for defensive players, but 
if a top five blue chip offensive player, which is the last thing they need from a cap roster construction, you know, on a number of levels, like what would Jerry Jones do? And I would be fascinated to be a fly on the wall if Pitts or Waddle is there. And so is Patrick Sertan. You're right. Like if, if Pitts, for some reason, the top 10 goes, you know what? We still don't like drafting tight ends that early. And he's sitting there and he's like, man, Blake Jarwin's not cutting it. That really could be interesting. Mike, I'm also curious. So if we think there's going to be quarterbacks going one, two, three, let me just run through the top 10. Do you think Atlanta takes a quarterback? I do. I think it's set up perfectly mm. for them. If I'm Arthur Smith and I'm going to be there for the next 10 years, I, I go in year one. I take a guy, let him sit behind Matt Ryan, very similar to what Kansas City did a couple of years ago with Alex Smith and Patrick Mahomes. So to me, if they're going to have that Justin Fields, Trey Lance debate. Okay, then you got Cincinnati, who they would then have the, you know, wide receiver offensive lineman of their choosing, then Miami, Detroit, I would imagine they're going to be sticking with golf, and then it's Carolina, Denver. Do you see teams trying to get in front of eight in front of Carolina to draft that other quarterback, or do you maybe see it going to Carolina there? Yeah, I think it's a great point. I could see Detroit at seven being able to move back and pick up additional assets because, and it could be New England, let's say. I think Chicago's too mm -hmm. far away to come that far up. But, you know, could you see a Detroit-New England trade going from 7 to 15? I think that certainly has to be in play. Um, I think Jimmy Garoppolo getting traded on draft day could factor into this as well. So there's a lot of variables. But I think Carolina is kind of the floor of this discussion. I agree with what Connor said a couple minutes ago, which is I think we could see five quarterbacks in the top eight. Now, which eight teams that is, I don't think that story's been written yet. All right, Mike, we're going to you. Today's show is about workout warriors. Take me to a private workout, a pro day that it's just etched in your mind. You cannot believe what that guy did. Yeah, it was really Darrell Rivas for us where at his pro day, we knew that um, there was no way we, we were at 25. We trade up to 14 and this going back a number of years ago, but the old Big East, that's where Pitt was. And there weren't really any good uh, receivers in that year in the conference. So Darrell de declared late. There wasn't a lot of great tape on him, not because he wasn't great, but there weren't really any frontline receivers. So it was really a great incomplete. And he blew it out of his pro day. And, uh, you know, we knew then and there that for us to get him, we were going to have to go up. And uh, that was one of those moves that certainly worked out. And we were really fortunate to get him. Well, tell me about the workout. What was the workout with Revis that you were like, I don't care who he faced. This is crazy to watch. You know, if you ever met Darrell, he is a really well-built, thickly, naturally strong guy. Like he, you know, sometimes guys that run fast or lean, like he's a strong, like all you have to do is shake his hand and you'll know what I mean. So he's a strong guy, but man, was he fast and could he change direction? And he really, that's why he's a Hall of Famer. He had it all. He had the ability to get a half a yard away from you and put his arm, hands on you, and it was over. But he also had the athletic confidence to go and trail, and he had great recovery speed. He could sink his hips and change direction. He really had it all. And after that workout, we were just convicted in, hey, this is a guy we want to go up and get. Um, and clearly there was no way he was going to be there where we were picking. Other side of the coin, uh, you're watching all these mock drafts and you're seeing all these reports about this superb athlete comes out and works for you. And you're like, I just don't see it. you ended up being right. What was one of those situations? Yeah, no, there, there, I would say there, there were a few of those. I would say a couple of offensive linemen along the way that, you know, when they lack foot quickness, it's over. You know, they can be strong. They can be tough. Um you know, one of the mistakes we made candidly was Anthony Schlegel, where we, we fell in love with him and his intangibles. We drafted him in the third round from Ohio State. He had transferred from Air Force. He just he did not work out great, and it was a lesson learned because that translated to, like, him just being a very poor space player. Um, but there was a number of offensive linemen along the way where if you don't have foot quickness, you, you can't play in the NFL. There's too many good athletic defensive linemen, and that's a very, like, with – it's a critical factor. If you don't have quick feet, there's nothing else really matters. Mm. To go to what you said earlier about Darrell Rivas, a cornerback at a workout that just knocks your socks off. We got that with Patrick Sertain the second this week. 6'2", 208, 4'4", 40, 10-foot, 11-inch broad jump, a 39-inch vertical, 
18 reps of 225. And Mike, we have a, a comment here from IMGBaby12, something that you talked about earlier. Do you think the Cowboys will draft perfect Patrick Sertan if he's available at 10? Tell me a little bit about the prospect and then also this question. Yeah, absolute no-brainer. You know, Sertan is one of these players. We just talked about the role he, was, he He checks all the boxes. His dad played in the league. He's been someone that's studied this position for a long time. We see it here make a really good play on the ball. He is well built. He has short area quickness. He has long speed. He's strong. You can see here forces a pitch. Um, very athletic, very competitive, great instincts and great competitiveness. So in terms of a corner, he, he has it all. He checks every box. He should be a top 10 pick. Um, you know, you see a lot of these plays now in college football, the, you know, these screens outside the numbers. It puts a huge emphasis on tackling for corners, which is something Coach Belichick talks about all the time, and Patrick Sertan can do that. He can play in any system. He has awareness to play in zone and instincts, but he has the athleticism and short area quickness to play in man. So he, he's not a scheme-specific uh, corner. has great instincts. Like I said, he's been around the game his whole life and been really well coached by Coach Saban. So I'd be really surprised if he fell below 10. And with Caleb Farley getting another back surgery, you would imagine it makes the the priority on a premier corner even more at the top of the draft. Connor, from the pro days that you've seen this week, workout warriors, what corners have jumped out to you? It's got to be him and uh, J.C. Horn. I mean, when you look at it and then you talk about, obviously, Farley having some questionable medical down the stretch. Uh, J.C. Horn is somebody that has made this conversation really interesting to probably be the second cornerback off the board. I, I agree with Mike that it's Sertain's show in the top 10. And then somebody's going to be looking for a physical corner that can press, that can run. He's obviously very, very explosive. Uh, he's a little too physical at times, especially with the way the NFL rules are. But I think you can coach that out of him. The confidence is incredible. Uh, we know he's Joe Horn's son, so he lives and breathes football for a long time now. J.C. Horn is somebody to be really excited about. I like these father-son combos. It gives me a lot of confidence on the kids. Mike, before I let you go, I need to know, who is your draft crush? Who is the player that you've been watching and that when guys call you up, you're like, have you seen this kid? Who, who is your, your draft crush right now? Boy, that's a good question. There's so many that uh, I like. You know, I think Darisaw from Virginia Tech, because he reminds me a little bit of uh, DeBrickishaw Ferguson. He's sort of like a quiet, steady, a little bit under the radar, you know, where all these mocks with Panay Suel, who's a good player. But I think when it's all said and done, and we look back in five years and talk about the class of 21, I think he's going to be this plug-and-play tackle that's steady, quiet. He's really a good foot athlete with long arms. I think he's your prototypical, prototypical left tackle and not getting a lot of buzz, and it just seems like he's really comfortable with that. Awesome. Mike Tannenbaum, man, thank you for the time. We're going to watch you on ESPN. I appreciate you, dude. All right. Appreciate you guys having me. Thank you. Thanks, Go Mike. Phillies. That felt good. <laughs> uh, Connor Garrisaw. I haven't heard this guy's name. Where is he in terms of the tackle rankings that Mike just mentioned? I love him. He's sitting sturdy at offensive tackle number three, Lefko, and my 15th player overall. Mm. So I love that Mike called that name out because – it's been a little bit of a quiet process for him. I think when you look at it, we know about Penny Sewell. We know about Rashawn Slater. You got guys that are getting love, like Vera Tucker, that might play guard and Tevin Jenkins. But Darisaw, he's a bit of a bully. You know, I mean, when you hear somebody compared, like Mike said, to, to Brickashaw Ferguson, I think that's really exciting. Darisaw got much better from a starter in 2018, 2019, 2020, took his game to a completely new level. You saw him going to climbing to the second level of the field and burying linebackers. When we get to those B-rolls one day on the draft, it'll be, uh, it'll be a lot of fun to watch. He's a player that excites me, and I think a team will look at him at right tackle as well. I think he has a lot of versatility. Um, listening to you and Mike talk about five quarterbacks in the top eight makes me realize, number one, man, the Dolphins did great with that trade to pick up all those picks and get back to six, which will likely get them the number one player at any position they want because they believe in Tua, whether it's tackle, wide receiver, shoot, they could go corner, which they don't even need because they got Xavier Howard and Byron Jones, but they have the pick of the litter. And it also makes a little bit of sense with the Eagles because if you're the Eagles and you know that you don't want one of those quarterbacks, you can't get Zach Wilson. Well, if five of the top eight are quarterbacks, 
all the good players are getting pushed down to you. So it should be a very interesting. It, who do you, which quarterback do you think goes last, Connor? Honestly, with all this buzz left go out of those top five, I think it's going to be Justin Fields. I think it's ridiculous. Wow. He's my quarterback three. I think it's absurd. I think it's stupid. Um, you know, and even all those rumors that we touched on earlier, you know, like I said, I asked people that would know, and it's not that, no, it's not that he's not working hard. He actually, he lifts and throws as much as anyone you'll ever see. So I think mm -hmm. it's just, it's a lot of nonsense, honestly, quite frankly. And just because he's not a rah-rah guy, we're used to quarterback classes with Baker Mayfield and Joe Burrow. And you love that about them. It's exciting. Justin Fields isn't going to be on Twitter or doing commercials or, or the guy that's the loudest one in the locker room, but people like him. That's okay. It's just that these things, these perceptions get taken to another level and it's, it's quite ridiculous. Now, with that being said, yeah. to answer your question, I do think he'll be the fifth quarterback off the board and that might benefit a Carolina or a Denver who already have pieces on their offense that that also might benefit Justin Fields in the long run too. Mm. i uh, got a great comment here from a handsome duck said Lefko is the biggest goober. Thanks, a handsome duck. Thanks for watching. What we're going to do now is we're breaking down the best workout wonders from like the last few weeks with Pro Days. And as Connor came up the list, there were two main groups, wide receivers and then edge rushers and linebackers. Typically, that makes sense when you're talking about workout wonders. Uh, we do have an app video comment. It is our second one of the day. And it's got a little bit of a monster mash feel. Let's take a look. Hey, Connor and Lefko. I was just wondering, for this year's wide receiver class, there are so many great talents. They're, they all excel in their own individual way. So if you had to do sort of a Frankenstein draft where you could create the perfect receiver, say Jamar Chase's frame with Jalen Waddle's speed, for example, what would your pick for that kind of guy be? Thanks. All right, Connor. Work your I, I love these questions. All right, now let's get right to it. He he started off with the two obvious. Jamar Chase, we're going body control, physicality. So right there, okay. that physicality. Jalen Waddle, the speed. We know about that. This is where it gets a little more fun, though. Devontae Smith's hands, perfect. Not dropping anything, this wide receiver. Now I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to sneak Kyle Pitts into here. Wingspan. He just recorded the biggest wingspan of the last 20 years for a tight end left go. Uh, he is a small forward out there on the football field. And then we'll go with uh, Rashad Bateman, releases and routes, pro ready, good to go. And then Rondell Moore's agility. His three cone was silly, absolutely stupid. We'll get to him isolated later. So that right there is your Frankenstein pass catcher. Can we talk about Pitts? Because I don't think we have him on the rest of our workout warriors. But what he did yesterday, uh, I kept seeing. Like when I, when I went on Twitter, and the two names that were trending were Kyle Pitts and DK Metcalf. I was like, oh, wow, he did one of those days. What did we see from Kyle Pitts with the Florida Pro Day? I mean, when you look at him, he's huge, right? He's almost six foot six, six foot five, five eighths, 245 pounds, giant hands. And like I said, the wingspan is the biggest recorded for a tight end that we've seen in the last 20 years. And then he goes and runs a 4 4 4 left going. I don't even think it was this perfect 40 for him. I honestly think he might be faster if you give him another attempt out there or you record his GPS field speed. So he catches everything. He's getting bigger and stronger, which is going to help him as an inline blocker or even a blocker out wide. We know he can jump and hang in the air forever because that's all on film already. There wasn't much Kyle Pitts had to do, but now when you see it on paper that he has really good wide receiver athleticism with tight end size and arms that could just reach up and touch the goalpost. He's a good one, man. It's, it's really, really exciting. If he was listed Kyle Pitts as a wide receiver and not a tight end, how would he be if seen in this class? I think for me, he would just be behind Jamar Chase and then Jalen Waddle as wide receiver three, just based on the pass catching skills alone, which goes to show you because I'm so high on those guys. They're both top 10 players for me. Yeah. Just how special he is. I mean, Jamar Chase is better than anybody in last year's class. And we know how good that class was with C.D. Lamb, who was my favorite really? of those three. Henry Ruggs goes first. Jamar Chase is better than any of them. There's no overthinking this player. He's out there beating 
NFL starting cornerbacks as a 19-year-old. The tracking, the hands, the physicality, now the speed. He went out and ran a 4.38 yesterday when everyone's like, well, we don't know if he can run. And then he jumps through the roof, a 41-inch vertical, an 11-foot broad jump. These are elite numbers with elite production for a 19-year-old at the time that was the number one wide receiver on a national championship team. There's no questions with Jamar Chase, and that's why he's probably going number five overall to be reunited with Joe Burrow. Mm. When I saw that Joe Burrow was lobbying the Bengals to draft his old wide receiver, and then I started going, man, if they get him some time with some offensive line, and he has T. Higgins and Jamar Chase, I was like, that's the trio for like the next five, ten years, man. It's cool when he's like trying to get his former teammate. I love that. So Jamar Chase, clearly your number one now. Sounds like it. Clear, clearly number one. Sitting there uh, nice and sturdy at, at player number six on the big board, and, and he's not going any further down. Mm, okay. So likely he's either going to Cincinnati at five or Miami at six is kind of what it sounds like. Uh, another wide receiver that is a workout warrior. Um, I keep seeing clips of him in terms of one-on-one -on -one shadow drills, dusting people. How did Rondell Moore do at his pro day for your second workout warrior? So an interesting start when he comes in at five foot seven and everyone's like, well, I thought he was five foot nine. And it's like, okay, well, how does it matter? We know he's small. We know he's a slot only. And we know he's one of the most agile, little compact, strong receivers we've seen in this class with top flight acceleration. So when you look at Rondell Moore, Lefko, it's not the five foot seven that jumps out six foot it's the six six eight three cone uh, elite agility numbers and i don't care that he's small he's not tiny he's just compact he's short he's muscled up once again testing numbers are really really good you're gonna have to get creative you've got to find a way to get the ball in this guy's hands jet sweeps screens underneath routes drag routes just find a way to clear out space and let him work but rondale moore I'm really excited about him. It's all about staying healthy. I know it's been a problem the last two years. If he could stay healthy, he's a legitimate difference maker and one of those home run kind of guys. Yeah. Height is something that prevents you from going in the first round, but it does not prevent you from going in the league. We are seeing – look at the market for Adam Humphreys in free agency the last few years. Just somebody that can work the slot and is all about agility and all about quickness. There's two different games. There's outside receiver and there's interior receiver. And it looks like Rondell Moore has all the tools for that. Uh, another wide receiver that you thought was a workout warrior had a monster vertical leap. My first question is who? And my second question is what do you learn from somebody with a crazy vertical? Well, it's Josh Matterbebe from Illinois, the transfer from USC. And I mean, he did this in high school. So did it shock anyone? Not necessarily, but you also see it on film. A 46 and a half inch vertical leap left go. It just doesn't get better than that. I don't even know if a lot of places go up that high. They probably had to find a custom. I've never form. seen that number. Before. And the quarterback play was not great for him. So the numbers might not really jump out at you. But when they just threw the ball up to him and gave him a chance, he's a big body target, target, big catch radius. We know he can hang in the air. I think he'll have a role in the NFL as a red zone player. I think the best is yet to come for him. It might have started out a little bit rocky having to transfer. And once again, not going to a program where you're going to put up these crazy pass catching numbers. But the workout's good. I like the film. And if somebody drafts him and says, hey, you'll be our number four, or number five wide receiver out of the gate. But when we get in that red area in the 20, look out for the jump ball. It's going to you. Uh, so it's pronounced a matter, baby. You nailed it. Love it. Uh, also, was he the one that the video where it looked like he was floating in high school on the vertical leap pad? Was that him? I, I think so. <laughs> it, it was recorded as 47 inches in high school which is just <laughs> hilarious so and then you know obviously it gets bigger stronger and still maintains it at 46 and a half it, it's just absurd and you could see him work on the outside of the field and you know underneath of course once i said i said it again a big muscled up frame that could take hits but also a jump ball player that dbs are going to have a lot of problems with in isolated situations which you'll see perfect example right there body control keep the feet in bounds perfect catch 
I'll tell you what, Illinois has been one of those universities, too, where they don't consistently put out players, but when they do, they're typically high-end athletes. Remember Brandon Lloyd out of Illinois? Stretch, jumper all the time. I think Vontae Davis went to Illinois as well. I, I think I may have been wrong. I'll look it up. It's okay. We'll roll with it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, you have one more wide receiver. Give me uh, a guy that most people that are in the comments right now have not heard, but whose pro day and performance got him a lot of attention. Sure. Well, we did the Davis Mills breakdown on the quarterback show, but now let's talk about his wide receiver in Simi Fajoko. And of course, when you look mm -hmm. on paper that he's six foot four, 222, and I'm not trying to give you bad J.J. Arcega Whiteside vibes here, Lefko. He's a little bit different of a player. Uh, he's a really, really tall wide receiver, but what jumped out to me, you see the straight line speed there. Of course, that is good. For 6'4", 222, the straight line speed, 4'4", That is very fast for that size. But to go with a 6'8", 6'3", cone, he's got a lot of agility, wow. and that's going to help with his route running. That's going to help after the catch. He's not just this tall, lumbering, stiff kind of player. He's a really, really good athlete that, once again, the best is yet to come. I don't think he's getting any love. I don't see him as a top 10 wide receiver on any list or any rankings or anything like that. Not a player mentioned to be drafted in the first two rounds, but everything is right there for you. Some monster games on tape, the size, the speed, but the agility is the one that shocked me and had, him, had to put him in our workout wonders list. Yeah, I know that you warned me ahead of time, but the uh, J.J. Arthago white side, just from seeing the Stanford Cardinal, just got me going. Uh, we have an app comment here, by the way. The app comments have been good. Papo Zai saying, G saying, yes, left Govante Davis did go to Illinois. I feel good about that one. Uh, app comment, this is from the Breadman 10. With the Giants signing Galladay and Jackson, do they go with Parsons if he's there? So Parsons would be Micah Parsons. Uh, what do you think about this question? The Giants are sitting at 11 right behind Dallas. It's a great question because there's not a lot of blue chip defensive players in this draft. And when you look at the Giants, they've been aggressive to say, hey, let's go get Daniel Jones some help. So do you look at Micah Parsons that they have a need at linebacker? And Dave Gettleman has invested early in linebacker in the past. It took Shaq Thompson in the first round when he was the GM of right. the Panthers. Micah Parsons, he's going to go earlier than the top, you know, that late first round kind of range. Want to talk about a workout wonder in Micah Parsons. 4 3 9 40, 10 foot 6 broad jump, 6 9 6 3 cone. Elite linebacker numbers where I want to say yes to this question that he's in consideration, but one big thing has to come into play here for me, Lefko. Do they think they can also use him as an edge rusher? I think he has the traits. We, the effective blitzing is on tape, but I'm talking hand in the dirt at times on mm. passing down edge rusher. Can he do that? That's something a lot of teams thought Jalen Smith thought he could do in that draft. That's why before he got hurt, he was a projected top 10 pick. So for Micah Parsons, wondering the same thing. The Giants need edge pass rush help. You did a good job. You went out and signed Adoree Jackson. You have James Bradbury. You have good corner play. You have a lot of money and resources tied up in the front four. But do you need somebody in the middle of the field? Absolutely. My question is, is it worth taking a linebacker with a top 15 pick? That's something they're going to have to answer. They still have a lot of questions on the offensive line, specifically at the guard spots with Rashawn Slater maybe there. That makes a little more sense to me. But with Dave Gettleman's history, the need on their defense, he has to be at least on the board and in consideration for them in that spot. And I'm looking to see if he'd be available. I don't know if Detroit goes with a linebacker that early just because they have done it in the past and their fan base remembers guys like Ernie Sims. Carolina seems to be very quarterback focused as well as Denver at eight and nine. And then you get to Dallas and they already have so much invested in their young linebacker core uh, that he might be there at 11 for the New York Giants. And if you end up getting the first defensive player taken at 11, Usually that guy ends up being pretty good. I think a lot of teams are also seemingly afraid of taking cornerbacks. So you talked there about Micah Parsons. Uh, what You mentioned edge. Did you talk about Jalen Phillips at all for the Giants if they don't go Micah Parsons at the edge? I did not, but I'm glad you brought it up because I would like to. I, I think with Jalen Phillips, he's a top 15 pick if teams are okay with his medicals. And we've talked about it on this show before. I uh, had to transfer him from UCLA. At one point, he medically retired because of the concussion history there comes back, gets his footing in Miami with kind of a year away from full football, 
comes back to the field in 2020, and he's the superstar that we thought he would be coming out of high school. And you want to talk about numbers again here for Jalen Phillips. He checks all the box at the position, and the Giants need something at edge rusher. 6'5", a little bigger than 6'5", 260. He reminds me of Ziggy Ansah left go, that kind of athleticism. 4'5", okay. 640, a 7'3", cone, 36-inch vertical. People look at those numbers and go, well, they're not as impressive as the ones you said for all these other guys. Yeah, but he's six foot six, 260 pounds. He's a huge human moving like that. He could bend and turn the corner. So I think he should be the Giants pick at 11 if you're okay with those medicals. That's a huge, huge question mark. But he is the most talented pass rusher in this draft by a mile. But is he the top pass rusher? There's a big difference, right? There's a lot of things you need to do behind the scenes to make sure. Connor, so a lot of scouts, front office guys, go to Penn State's Pro Day, and they're there to watch Micah Parsons, who puts up those numbers that you mentioned, a 4-3-9-40, a 6 9 6 cone, insane. But I'm looking at your notes here, and apparently one of the workout warriors happened there as well. So they're all there for Micah Parsons. Who else caught their eye? Yeah, Jason Oway, the edge pass rusher from Penn State. Uh, he is one of the most polarizing players in this draft, Lefko. What if I told you the first part, that he didn't have a sack in 2020? you got to go back to 2019 to find these plays where he gets after the quarterback. But then what if I told you at 257 pounds, he runs a sub 4 440 with a 439, jumps 10 foot 6 inches broad, which is just insane, and a 6963 cone, which to me is the most important testing number of an edge rusher because it's that agility as along with the 10 yard split. You want to see that get off. So this is the ultimate test left go of production versus traits and athleticism. How will teams mm. value it? We've seen them in the past reach for these guys and miss. We've also seen them be rewarded. I think Montez Sweat and Daniil Hunter come to mind to me as guys that great size, great athleticism, might not wow you a ton in the box mm. score throughout their college career. Is Oway the next one? I have some questions about his long-term projection, but man, the workout just couldn't have been better. Nearly a 40-inch vertical, and 11-foot, 2-inch broad jump. Uh, yeah, those guys, and we've seen a few of them out of Penn State. Who, who, what was the defensive lineman's name out of Penn State a few years ago that was very similar to this in terms of the athletic profile? I think the Bills drafted him. Well, we had the Bills uh, take Aaron Maven a long time ago. That's the guy. Just that's the guy. Freak show athleticism, and that's a good example of one that did not pan out. So you, Penn State, yeah. it's ridiculous what they do in the weight room every year i you know if i'm gonna have to run this 40 for the show can i go to penn state for four weeks and maybe come back uh, sub five speed what about we're gonna stay with the edge workout warriors arrival of penn state michigan i see in your notes here that there was a workout warrior there what was his name yeah quitty pay you know six foot two uh really stocky kind of build six foot two over 260 pounds now, unfortunately for Quiddy Pay, he did have a tight hamstring, I believe, during his workout. So we didn't get to see the full show. We got the 45440. That's good speed. 36 bench reps. I mean, this dude is a wow. unit, an absolute tank. They love his work ethic at Michigan. Let me get that off the top because a lot of people say, hey, he's raw in his pass rush plan. He won't fail for lack of trying and effort. So he's a good investment. You see the pop there against, I believe, Indiana. They had a rough day against him. Now, Lefko, what I want to talk about with Quiddy Pay is he didn't get to do it because he did get hurt. This man is supposedly recorded the most legendary three cone for an edge pass rusher. And there's reported times at 637. The video is out there on the internet, so you can time it yourself. Six, uh, we've three, never even seven. had we've never had a three cone in the stratosphere for an edge pass rusher. I think the best one is usually in like the six seven. So if you don't believe me, that's okay, because I didn't believe it when I read the Feldman Freaks article over the summer, but Quiddy does have the video. It's online. Just insane movement ability, insane agility for that size. It's really impressive. I mean, that's like up there with top wide receivers. I mean, it's, it's quicker than Rondell Moore, who I thought was the most agile player in this whole testing. At five I foot mean, seven. Bust I mean, Buster Screen ran the third fastest three-cone drill, and he's a cornerback, and he ran a 6-4-4. Four, four. And you're telling me this kid ran a 6-3? Yeah, he's teleporting, essentially, from cone to cone is what he has to be doing. 
But if you're watching the show, I promise at the end of it, Google Quitty Pay. You can watch the video on Twitter. It is amazing. And it is P-A-Y-E for people listening. Uh, it's 100% because he's wearing a Michigan jersey, but I'm watching him. I'm going, looks like a Brandon Graham kind of guy to me. Low center of gravity, not the biggest guy in the world, but just hustle effort all the time. Uh, one last guy you got for us in terms of the Workout Warriors defensive side, Kentucky linebacker. Is it Jameen Davis? Yeah, Jamin Davis. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Jamin I Davis. think this is the – this is the riser of the draft right now, and, and the tape is very good. I think he's very good against the run, sideline to sideline speed, good range. I think he will develop a lot as a cover backer as well. All the tools are there, and the workout was very good. 4-4, 140, 42-inch vertical for a linebacker left go. That is absolutely nuts. He is jumping wow. through the ceiling at that size, and he's got good size. I'll say it right now for him. He's going probably in the first round. You feel pretty good about that. And this is a name that if you brought it up three months ago, nobody would think that. So a big riser for Davis. Mm. That's I, I love to see that. Are you ready for app comment rapid fire Q&A? Let's Kyle do it. Rogers. Okay. We're going to first start off. We're going to try and go rapid fire-y, but we're going to start off with a video comment from mcosta69. Let's check it out. My draft question, what quarterback between Trask, Mond, and Mills turns out to be the better NFL quarterback? Thank you. You're welcome. Connor, go. I just love the vibes of that question. I mean, where where was that question asked? Wow, it's tough. You know, I'm going to say Trask, I think, will be a long-term backup. I'm going to say Mond has the biggest ceiling. So I'm going to throw the dart out there that Mm. Mond has the biggest ceiling, and I'll go with him. But for pure evaluation, Trask is the safer player. You're right, though. When you're dealing with these guys, if you go with the guy with the highest ceiling and he hits it, you cover your ass, which is really well done by you. Okay, rapid-fire questions. Next one. Put them on the screen. It is Serious Fan 120. The Falcons seem to be the biggest question mark of the draft. What do you think they do, Connor? Go. I think they trade the pick. And I know Mike Tannenbaum said he thinks they take a quarterback. Arthur Smith looked super excited watching Justin Fields. That's a smart move. I agree. So I hope they take Justin Fields and let him sit behind Matt Ryan. But right now, I'm leaning about 60% that they trade this pick. Next question is coming in from. M. Billock 30. Who was the draft sleeper for surprise first round pick? Yeah, I just gave it to you. It's got to be Jamin Davis right now. I think that's the one uh, that really jumps out to me. And maybe one more would be Tevin Jenkins, the, uh, the offensive tackle from Oklahoma State. Rapid fire follow up question. Uh, who would be the quarterback that sneaks into the end of the first round if one does go in the end of the first round? Don't, I'll ask Richard Head's question second. I'll say Kellen Mond. Oh, look at it. Kellen Mond. Okay. Uh, Richard Head, who has been the biggest faller in this year's draft? No. Oh, it it hurts, but it's Greg Rousseau from Miami. Uh, You're talking about testing that is below the 20th percentile for a player that, before he opted out, was in the top 10 of every single summer mock draft. Yes, there are sickos like me that read summer mock drafts 10 months ahead uh, before the draft. So a tough fall for Gregory Rousseau, who – did not play, and then did not test well at all. Is there any chance it's an Orlando Brown Jr. situation where the testing isn't great, but the, the tape is what really matters? Yes, Lefko. I did not drop him to – I've seen people say day three. I've seen people say round three. Uh, I'm not there. I, I think he is. he's a top 75 pick. He's a really hard worker where he's just getting better. I, I'm, I would bet on him in the second round. I'm okay with that. Learn from past years. Remember when that happened to Orlando Brown, and now he's like a yeah, franchise Yeah, I killed him for it, and I – absolutely. Huge miss from me. Loved the film, hated the testing, dropped him way too far. You learn your lesson the hard way. Uh, next one up, this one's coming from Tom Ross. Oh, excuse me, Dylan Eakey. Who are the most sh- – oh, what are the most shocking rumors you're hearing right now, Connor? What are the shockers? I mean, I think we talked about this on the first show with Andrew Whitworth. Rashawn Slater could be the first offensive lineman off the board. So I hope you got those bets in why it was plus 400, because that's pretty juicy odds. you got to like that a lot. 
I think shocking rumors to me, Lefko, not, but it's so obvious and maybe people are tired of hearing of it. I'm not buying that Mac Jones is going third overall. I'm not. I think it's Trey Lance. I think they have the perfect infrastructure in place for Trey Lance to go. They're keeping Jimmy G. I don't think they're trading him. Maybe I'll be wrong about that too come draft weekend. I think Jimmy G will go into camp as the starter. You have Trey Lance behind him. I can't see Kyle Shanahan giving up three first-round picks for Mac Jones. And if he does, we're going to have a conversation on that draft desk. So then quick follow-up before the last question. Why? Why all this Mac Jones smokescreen? Because, oh, well, because they're probably doing a good job of fooling everyone. And number two, everybody you talk to in the NFL is just gushing about Mac Jones. It's the the personality, getting the ball out, the ball placement, all of these different things. But uh, I, I don't care necessarily about those things. I think Justin Fields and Trey Lance are better quarterbacks. I think Kyle Shanahan's offense has been limited by guys like the Kirk Cousins of the world or Love Matt Ryan, but there's still limited things you can do in that offense. Jimmy G, limited offense. There's no limitations of what you can draw up with Trey Lance or Justin Fields. Hmm. Last rapid fire question. Let's fill up the screen with the question. What about, how do you say his name? Amon Ra St. Brown? Amon Ra St. Brown? I think you nailed it the first time. Eamon Ron St. Brown, I believe he's related to Equinamia St. Brown. Yeah. Nobody's talking about this guy. I get there's some other great receivers out there, but come on, man. I mean, listen, you got to, you know, be careful where you get your draft info from. He's 62 overall for me. That's a really good wide receiver in this class. I think he's one of the better jump ball wide receivers. It, it's a physical profile. It's a go up and win the football. Pretty tough player after the catch, but he does his best work in the middle of the field and in the red zone. And I think people will be talking about him on that second night of the draft. And he's in my top 10 wide receivers of this great class. Mm. Should be interesting. Is he a debated prospect for you or you think you're pretty confident in him? No, I feel pretty good about it. I don't, I don't think you have to overthink him too much. Well, there are a lot of draft picks that people are debating, the most debated prospects, and that is going to be our theme next week. So we gave you eight workout warriors, a little breakdown of the trades with Mike Tannenbaum. Thanks so much for him joining us uh, every Thursday, live, 1 o'clock, here on the app, BR Gridiron Twitter, YouTube, and then, of course, getting pushed out on the Left Coast Show as a podcast. And then also, make sure that you guys send in your video comments to the B our draft stream we pick three every week those three that get played get a hoodie and we are now four weeks away from the nfl draft connor any farewell message before we get out of here today i mean talking to mike t was awesome obviously somebody that's built successful football teams that i watched when i was in high school so i think for me that was pretty cool and next week's going to be a lot of fun left though what is better about the draft than debating prospects mm. DK Metcalf was debated. Derek Henry was debated. There's Justin Herbert was debated. The debates yep. can be fun. Lamar you Jackson. The White White. Lamar Jackson. Baker Mayfield. All of them. It's Josh Allen. It's always crazy. And we're going to have the biggest names next week for Connor Rogers. I am the LEFKOE man to everybody that watched. We appreciate you. And we will see you next week, 1 o'clock Eastern. Have a good weekend.